Hello and welcome to PFF Fantasy Football Podcast. I'm your host, Ian Hart. It's back with NFL football. Hope you guys enjoyed the USFL show on Monday. We'll be back with some more USFL content after some actual games are played. But let's stick in the moment, get back to preparing us to win some money in the 2022 fantasy football season. As always, I'm joined by none other than PFF rock star fantasy analyst extraordinaire, Dwayne The Rock McFarlane. Dwayne, you're shaking your head, but whatever. Well, man. It's, 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 well, I think it's funny, you know, Rockstar and Dwayne the Rock. I don't know. I guess the case, <laughs> there's plenty of rocks in there. I can't yeah. believe you didn't at least mention on USFL, like, dude, we're gonna have a pretty sweet surprise for folks. Well, like, if you really want to be, be into USFL, it's yeah, supposed to be a surprise, Dwayne. Yeah, you got to tease it. You at least got to tease <laughs> yeah. it. I didn't say we're gonna tell everybody. Isn't that what we're doing right now? Okay, so yeah. <laughs> with uh, with with that in mind, a uh, great little show for you all today. I uh, mentioned this on the last podcast where we went through uh, the 25 players that I believe, you know, saw their situation proven for agency, but Dwayne has a fantastic piece up on PFF.com, basically showing where, hey, if you had this sort of draft strategy in your first uh, five or six rounds, what should you be doing around seven through 10? Because uh, Dwayne has done some reverse engineering, hot little SEO line there. Uh, Dwayne, I'm sure Austin loved that one. And uh, we can basically look back and decide. I'm sure absolutely no one ever searches <laughs> for those words. So <laughs> fancy football, reverse engineering and Google, just, just owning that market. But uh, we've got great stuff there. And then I um, also want to talk a little bit about uh, this weekend's favorite fantasy topic that is receiver separation, contested catches and kind of what to make about that so good little show on tap Dwayne how about you start things off here describing your reverse engineering article and what goes into that because uh, you know all, all jokes about maybe the organic search uh friendliness aside I, I I did read through it this morning and I think uh, what you're talking about is obviously very smart and it's something that I think everyone usually does anyway with your fantasy drafts but maybe we don't actually think it through clearly enough to take advantage of it the way you describe it yeah. So the way I think about this, um, you know, and it is a pretty simple, you know, concept, like this isn't like, you know, some rocket science kind of thing, but it's something, it's one of the first things I do every year. Like as I'm walking through uh, my draft plan, my strategy, how I think I'm really going to think about executing. And because the whole goal is like, if you, you want to be thinking far enough ahead in your draft that you are going to know how to adapt and be flexible, like as you make your picks, right. And as you start to build out your roster, um, but I think there's a few key things that you want to do. And so what I like to do, Ian, is start, I like to go into the later rounds or the the mid late rounds. So basically every year, the cutoffs are a little different. Like some years, like I might think this starts in the sixth round. Some years I might think it starts in the eighth. Some years it may end in the 12th. Some years it may end in the 10th or 11th round, but there usually ends up being this really sweet spot um, in the draft where you feel really confident around certain positions and certain players. And so, for example, if you're sitting there and in your, you know, ranks, you're looking at 80 and an easy way to do this also is just start looking at ADP where, you know, you feel really good about certain players that are landing in tiers, um, but they land in the same tier as a guy going in the fifth, but you know, you can get them in the seventh, right? And so you start to add those up basically. And so um, like a few years ago when I did really, really well in an FFPC format, I didn't win the 250 grand. I won second place that year, Ian. Ooh. My whole strategy, really honestly, and this is where every year can be different, I really did go more running back heavy early. And then there are other years where I've gone wide receivers heavy early. But it was all due that year to young talent sitting at the top of the draft board for running back. So I had Kareem Hunt, Le'Veon Bell, Todd Gurley, and I had that stack multiple times. Um, obviously, I didn't need anyone else, honestly, on my team after that. Like I destroyed like all of those leagues. But <laughs> the other part that made it work is I loved Zach Ertz. Um, in the fifth round that year in a tight end premium league. I thought he would lead the Eagles and targets that year. And I knew that I could get him um, at, a, at a really good price. Like I, he was almost always there. That's the other thing you're looking at. And then the other part was I just really felt good about Devontae Adams. There were like a group of like six or seven receivers and even Marvin Jones, some other guys were in this. And so I just felt like, hey, I can go after these running backs early, come back in my tight end premium, grab a receiver in the fourth, get Zach Ertz, you know, in the fifth. Um, and that year, I think Kelsey was going in the third or fourth too. So he was an option. But Shout then I knew- to, uh, Real quick, I, we always yeah. love talking about the uh, names of these draft strategies. And I like poking a little fun at the zero RB crowd and calling it, you know, zero RB or everything else in the world is literally modified zero RB. But there is a hero in the fantasy community who took this more seriously than me. TJ Hernandez, four for four. Dwayne, first, if you draft a running back in the first two rounds, 
superhero RB for <laughs> TJ. I absolutely love it. And we are rolling with that moving forward. Yeah. Uh, Pat Corain had one last year too. Um, I can't remember what he called it, but like the upside you're looking for, I can't remember what he called it, uh, but it was well, kind of like same thing. Super. You're basically looking for these super, the superhuman running back. So um, basically by doing that, you know, kind of where I was going is all of a sudden you have this, I've had, I felt really good about a group of receivers um, that year as well. And so, and not all of them worked out, but enough of them worked out. And I knew I was, it wasn't going to be super tight. So you can't build a strategy like this where, you know, there's only two players you like. You're like, I'm just going to get these two players every time because somebody will snipe you, man. And then like your whole plan is like gone. You got to feel pretty good about a group of players at a certain position that you feel like there's value there. And then so what happens is as you start to draft, for example, let's say this year, um, troll to the tight end part, Ian, real quick. Like so for this year, for tight ends, it's pretty straightforward for me. Um, number one, high level, I do believe it's between round seven and 10, maybe round 11. This year, there are a few players going around 11. And this is going and this is using FFPC data. Um, so this is due with Fantasy Mojo. Um, so appreciate him giving us that data today. Um, but as far as looking at what that range is like, it's between round seven and 11. Um, that could change some, obviously, after the draft. So we'll have to keep an eye on it. But tight ends are a great example. So this is a tight end premium format. So you need to have one. But if you don't take one by the second or third round, the way I look at it this year, you at least need to do it by the eighth end. Because in the eighth round, you've got Rob Gronkowski, who's going to shoot up to like, you know, a sixth, fifth round pick. Um, if once he signs with the Bucs, you got Albert O, who we've talked about. You got Zach Ertz. And I think those are the three. Like you're going to need to save a pick in round eight. So if all of a sudden you're four or five rounds into the draft and you don't have a tight end, like you need to be planning ahead for round eight, knowing that you're going to go ahead and grab one of those three guys. Now, notice I didn't just give you one name. If you're at the end of the list and you're at your like, this is my stopping point, you can't just have one name on the list. And so that's a great example for uh, tight end. And I think it's really By the nice. way, with, with Ertz, I don't think that he's necessarily going anywhere. Like Gronk, I think once he is firmly not retiring, I know we're both under the assumption that he will be playing for sure. Once he clarifies that, got to imagine he'll be moving up. Albert O has already been on the rise, I think, throughout the offseason. If Denver makes it through the draft without taking anybody, I don't think he's going to move up that much higher. Zach Ertz, though, Dwayne, is going this late with less question marks than anybody, more available opportunity than pretty much anyone. I mean, he could be Kyler Murray's number two pass game option. I thought the years of Ertz, you know, getting 120 plus targets were over. The guy you know, actually played pretty damn well last year. Once he got to Arizona, tight end four overall the rest of the way. And the fact that he's still going here, absolute crime. I love that we're taking advantage of that. Yeah, so the way you're thinking through it, let's say you do take George Kittle or Darren Waller at the turn, you know, at the two, three turn in a tight end premium league. You know, if you're in a normal league, that may happen around round four or five. It doesn't matter. It's all relative, right? These things kind of move around based on your scoring formats. Well, then all of a sudden, you don't need to be saving a round eight pick right? For tight end. But it's by knowing these things, you're able to plan ahead. And honestly, the biggest thing I see drafters do is they self-destruct. They'll start off with a really strong draft, but they're not thinking ahead like this. And then all of a sudden they look up and they're like, wow, I've got all these great receivers. My running back, my tight end and my quarterback suck. Like, because they just didn't think through these things. Um, the other thing is it can be flexible. If all of a sudden you get to the you know eighth round, and there's five other names on the list for whatever reason this draft you're in, tight ends are going later, well, then you can adapt your plan. Then you're like, mm -hmm. you know what? I'm going to take my tight end in the ninth, but I'm going to go ahead and take this other position here in the eighth. But the thing I would say this year, Ian, what's interesting is around this round seven through 10 is you can literally do anything you want. This mm -hmm. range allows you to start with any kind of construction that you want to start about. And if you'll scroll up, we can kind of start with the so quarterbacks. You can get your QB one starting in round seven. You could get Tom Brady, Russell Wilson, or Dak Prescott in round seven. Round eight, you can still get Aaron Rodgers or Jalen Hurts. Like, they're both going to be top 12 quarterbacks, and they both have upside. Rounds nine and ten, if you want to wait a little bit more and you want to go more with the young upside, you can go with Trey Lance or Justin Fields. If you like a little bit more of a proven commodity, Derek Carr and Kirk Cousins are going to both be there, and we've already talked about them in our quarterback tiers uh, episode two weeks ago. And we talked about, it. like, there's hidden upside with Derek Carr and Kirk Cousins. Like, they could throw for 5,000 yards this year. Kirk Cousins has a new offensive coordinator. They're using more 11 personnel, probably going to throw the ball a little more. Derek Carr now has 
that has Devontae Adams, Hunter Renfro, Darren Waller. They all stay healthy. you got Josh McDaniels calling things. They're going to go with that quick passing game. I would expect them to run the ball a little bit less than what we've seen in previous years with John Gruden. So these are all options. And then a guy that belongs, I think, in the same tier, and we talked about him, was Ryan Tannehill. Right now he's going in the 11th round. But this is a guy that we know um, they've already added Robert Woods to go, go along with A.J. Brown. They've already added Austin Hooper. Not that that's huge, but I think it's an upgrade over the tight ends they had last year. And they've been linked to multiple receivers and tight ends in the draft. They're probably taking one in the second round. So you're going to have Tannehill with this vastly upgraded offensive uh, unit of receivers to throw to. And we've already talked about Derrick Henry multiple times and where he is. He's already over the 1,500 carry mark. Like we could be facing a very real situation where we need to be prepared for the Titans offense to slightly change this year. I think this is the year that that could happen. Having done a handful of these best ball drafts so far, I can confidently say I do not want to start my quarterback room with someone after Tannehill. Not saying those guys can't boom. I've talked about Daniel Jones being, you know, one of my favorite late, late round quarterbacks to maybe have as your second or third guy on the squad. You can talk yourself into Tua. There are other Trevor Lawrence year two boom. Like we could see it, but nobody can we actually look at in a similar manner as Tannehill has proven QB one upside in an offense that we're expecting to at least be good. So I think Tannehill, again, it might not be the sexiest pick, but if you are sitting there, you know, round 10, 11, I do think he's the last guy you want to grab from this group, but I'm with you, Dwayne. Ideally we can just go wait, you know, nine, 10 and get one of these guys that are lingering a little bit far down either way. I mean, it's just good to be able to have that, I guess, figured out. Have your QB one by round 11 is the main thing. And this is best ball. Like once redraft gets, these will sag a little bit, right? And redraft, like Trey Lance and Justin Fields, they'll slide in the 11th and 12th round. And best ball, because of the format, folks are all kind of in a race to get two. Everybody pretty much wants two. Now you'll see some somebody that'll grab Josh Allen early, and they'll just and, – and I agree with the strategy. You kind of risk it. You, you may wait and get down to around 14 or 15 before you take, you know, your QB2. But for the most part, people that start – like in round six or seven, they're going to go ahead and grab another quarterback by like round 12. So to your point, that kind of compresses everything. Once we get to redraft Ryan Tannehill, you'll probably be able to get like round 13, 14. Um, like he's going to be an even better value there. Um, and then redraft, back, so, like you don't even need a second quarterback. Just for Yeah, you don't even have to take one. Yeah, you just wait. And that's, and that's why they fall further. Like mm-hmm. I'm an actual, like that's a strategy that I use every year. Most people, even really good drafters, I see still draft two quarterbacks and I don't know why. I really, especially if I get a good one, I just draft one and then I can work the waiver wire after that. Um, So with quarterbacks, that's a high confidence. Like that that list we just gave, Brady, Wilson, Prescott, Rodgers, Hurts. Even if you want to stop there and you're like, man, I don't know about Trey Lance and Justin Fields and all that. That's I'm not comfortable. Okay, great. Round seven and eight. Just know, though, remember, if you started off heavy at running back and receiver, and now thing, you, you know you don't have your tight end yet. You don't have your quarterback yet. Well, guess what? Round seven and eight. Like if you really want to make sure you're getting a, a player that you have high confidence in being able to carry that position, you're going to you're going to have to spend those two picks. And the thing is, like, there's a lot of other things that are going to be attracting, you know, you, you in those rounds, because we're about to talk about the running backs and receivers. And there's a lot of goodness there as well. But high confidence at quarterback. So I like that um, running backs. Round seven and eight, you can get A.J. Dillon, Kareem Hunt, Tony Pollard. Um, so the, the thing I like about those guys, Ian, and I'll get your thoughts. So with A.J. Dillon. Look, we, I think we both agree Aaron Jones is like a really good receiving back, and that should be the role Aaron Jones has. Aaron Jones probably more is the – not probably. He's the more explosive back than A.J. Dillon, even though he's older. Um, but I do think that we'll see Aaron Jones probably get used more in the passing game, which could open up even a little bit more on the ground for A.J. Dillon. But the other plus is Dillon has, man, such the contingency upside. Like if for some reason Aaron Jones goes down, I mean, A.J. Dillon's going to be an RB1 every week that that happens. Um, Kareem Hunt. Similar situation, not quite as good, but again, big play threat, also involved in the receiving game with contingency upside should Chubb go down. We know they did resign Dearness Johnson, so I think that hurts Kareem Hunt a little bit this year, and I think that's why he's sliding some in ADP. Last year, you know, he was fifth, sixth round pick. He's a little bit older this year. Um, He started off the gate, out of the gates really hot. He had the injury last season, but I think now people have seen Dearness Johnson, and they're like, well, even if Nick Chubb gets hurt, like Cream Hunt isn't probably fully unlocked. And I think that's fair, but he still hits a profile that I love in round seven through eight. You know, he's the team wants to run the ball. That's the position that he plays. They don't have a lot of weapons. And guess what? He's good at explosive plays. He's really good in the passing game. 
Last guy for me here in these round seven through eight is Tony Pollard. We've talked about Zeke a lot on the show, but well past the 1,500 touches. Pollard could be more involved in the in the passing game as well. The Cowboys have lost some targets, and Tony Pollard's explosive. So the contingency value, though, with Pollard, I think, is probably in. I would rank it higher than Kareem Hunt. I think A.J. Dillon and Tony Pollard are similar, like, in their contingency value. Should Zeke go down like Pollard, man, whew, like, it's gonna, he's going to be an RB1 every week. Yeah, like legit, maybe top five. I mean, we've seen them, I think, only once. Actually, it was that 49ers game at the end of uh, 2020. I think he did work as the overall RB1 or RB2. A couple of it. I mean, it was similar, I think, to uh, when Javante Williams did. Like, you see a big play here. Oh, okay, he caught seven passes. Like, yeah, those are the types of things that can happen when you're actually on the field every single down, with which Pollard firmly has in his range of outcomes if Zeke is going to be out. Would just point out, I understand he's not in this group because he's going later, but Alexander Madison checks a lot of these same boxes and is available as an even cheaper running back that you can get in the double digit round. So agree with everything you said. And I, I like and the only, the of- only difference for me with Madison is I believe Dylan hunt and Pollard can give you spike week RB two production More likely. Yeah. Where Madison won't Madison. The only way is when Dalvin cook goes down, unless they change like the, the share right between yeah. Madison and Dalvin cook. Exactly. Um, but yeah, Madison, I, if, if I was, <clears throat> Putting like around 11 and 12 guys on here, he definitely would have been on the list. That, that's your upside swing. But for best ball, like the thing I like about these guys, you get that huge contingent upside, but you're also probably going to get spike weeks out of them anyway. They can help you fill an RB2 or an RB or a flex role, you know, depending on the format that you're playing in. The other guys going in this range, Damian Harris, you know, it's going to be a three headed committee, but you know, you can get spike week potential out of Damian Harris. Devin Singletary, we'll see what happens in the draft. If, if they don't draft a back, which they're getting linked more and more to different backs um, here over the last week and a half. But if they don't take one, I mean, Devin Singletary is going to climb two rounds yeah. um, in ADP by the time we get to August. So, again, like with these, you don't want to be taking your RB1 here, in my opinion. Like I would not be so stubborn as to wait for this. Things could break really perfect for you and everything works out. I, when I try to go uh, you know, receiver heavy, that kind of a draft, I mean, I still want to at least have one guy, what you call him superhero, hero, whatever you want to call him. Like, I want to have one anchor. I basically just want to be trying to have a group of guys fill my RB2. And, and best ball is great because you don't have to pick which one every week. Like, if it just happens, you know, and you got two or three of these guys, like, you're in really good shape. But again, yeah, that's the thing here. We're starting in round seven talking about this. So feasibly, I think based on – you know, we talked about the quarterbacks that are available in this range. We could be looking at having two high-end running backs with four legit wide receivers before we even have to get into this conversation. So, yeah, definitely too late for the RB1. I don't even know how good I feel about these guys as my RB2, but my God, RB3, RB4, you can definitely wrap your mind around. Well, if you time. wait for RB2 here, the thing is you have to take multiple. Yeah. Right, you can't wait and say, "Well, I'm going to get AJ Dillon." That's my RB two. No, you can't. <laughs> you're you're going to need AJ Dillon and a Tony Pollard, AJ Dillon and a Damian Harris, AJ Dillon and a Rashad Penny. Yeah. You know, you're really going to need an AJ Dillon, a Rashad Penny, and a Chase Edmonds. Like that. That's the way your brain has to start. And again, that's why it's important to be planning ahead because there's going to be other stuff that you want and need here. So if you're going wide receiver heavy and you've already got your tight end one, you've got your RB one, and you've already got your QB one. By the time you get to round seven or eight, well, then it's fine. You can unload on these guys. You can say, okay, I'm going to take three of them in a row, two of them in a row. But again, you have to be disciplined. You can't turn around and shoot yourself in the foot and be like, well, I got to have Rondell Moore in the 10th. Like that's already gone. Like your roster construction, has, at some point, you have to value your roster construction just over the players you want. Yes, you want access to upside. But basically, this is showing you how to think about, um, you know, where is your upside going to come from in your draft? At some point, you know, and I look, you don't have to just fill. I'm not saying you have to fill out starters before you start taking like your wide receiver five. Like I'm not, I'm not saying that at all. You, this gives you the path in which you can do both of those things. You can choose to continue to pound upside, get the guys you want, but also not neglect your overall roster construction together. A few other running backs you have listed around nine, Rashad Penny, what we've, who we've already kind of dubbed our arguably fantasy's cheapest three down back, depending on how the Chris Carson things get, thing goes. But even then, Pete Carroll is on record. I know it doesn't always mean the most, but he is on record saying Penny will get the first crack at that starting job. Cordero Patterson, you know, always his best case scenario was returning back to Atlanta. He, like, he is unironically getting featured in Falcons social media tweets as the biggest star in this offense. You can laugh if you want. Either way, going round nine, you know, that having someone with that sort of rushing and receiving upside, we will absolutely take that as our third or fourth RB. You mentioned Chase Edmonds. We got Ramon Andre Stevenson here as well. 
Ronald Jones, Dwayne, in round 10 is pretty interesting because, first of all, Rojo is not as bad as everyone makes him out to be. He's actually a very good rusher, and you look at kind of his advanced statistics there on the ground, he's been very good. Very good. I'm not exaggerating on the ground purely as a rusher since entering the league. He's going to Kansas City. It reminds me a little bit of James Conner last year, Dwayne, in terms of he, Rojo is very affordable. He, what happens if Clyde edwards helaire gets hurt again? There's a chance that Rojo takes over a three-down role. I'm not saying he's necessarily qualified for that, but at the end of the day, we're looking at a veteran running back that a lot of people have just decided he sucks, but he's entering great offense and he's awfully affordable. So clearly the Chiefs like Rojo more than we do. I think we should pay a little more attention to yeah him. and even if he doesn't get the passing down role if edwards alaire were to go down if we go back and look at the utilization of edwards alaire any of those weeks where he got like up to 65 percent of the rushing attempts and wasn't even that involved in the passing game you know he was a borderline rb1 all of those weeks you know if, if not like a low-end rb2 so i think that's the kind of role that rojo could easily step into right all of a sudden handling 60 to 60 there's a chance rojo handles half of the rushing attempts anyway so I think that there is con there's contingent upside built in with Rojo if something happens to Edwards Alaire, which Edwards Alaire has had has battled injuries both of his first two seasons. Yep. Um, so I think you know looking at him, it's just it, you're also making a bet on the Chiefs' offense, who we know is going to have to figure out how are they going to score points because they're not going to have Tyree Kill. So maybe the offense takes a slight step back, but there's more opportunities for other players. One other thing I would say really quick: notice there are archetypes that I'm giving you guys, like round nine. Rashad Penny, what does he have? He has huge uh, upside because of his big playability, right? And so even if you're on a team like the Seahawks, who we don't think are very good, you still want to, on those kind of offenses, you want to gravitate to a back that can still, you know, break off a 40, 50-yard run. Because guess what? They're probably not going to be down inside the five a whole bunch. You're going to need somebody that can give you upside to get to touchdown potential, even if the offense, everything's not going well. Patterson. Explosive plays last year in the receiving game. Chase Edmonds, explosive playmaker last year, involved in the receiving game. So those are very specific criteria that I'm using to, to, to highlight these three players. And you'll notice you'll, if you go look at ADP, there are other running backs going in that range. I'm not talking about them for a specific reason. Like this is the archetype of player that I'm really looking to try to get exposure to in round nine, because if things break right, you know, like it, it, he could, these could be players that should have been taken in round four, five, three. Yeah, I mean, you have 10 guys listed across three rounds, so this is not it's, – it's, it's hardly like you're just putting your foot down. It's like, oh, you absolutely need to have this guy at this specific spot. That's what we're trying to avoid here, and I thought your point about Rondale Moore earlier was good. We've been talking about him as being great value. I would like to have Rondale Moore in every single team, Me but too. I can I – can, <laughs> I can specifically remember some drafts though last year, Dwayne, like where AJ Dillon was irresponsibly my RB2 because of how many wide receivers I kept looking at and saying, well, my God, how could I let him pass? You know, how could I not add this guy to the squad? Keeping in mind that roster construction is awfully important. Hey, real quick, Ian, I want to get your right. thoughts like before yeah. we move on to receivers. So the other thing that I put in the article that folks can see is there's a cutoff. And so basically this is more of a how many I think you probably want to have of a position. And again, we'll update this as we get, move into redraft season and after the NFL draft, all those kind of things. But right now, I think by round 10, minimum, you want three backs. I would rather have four, but three would be three would be OK. But if you're going to go three, that means you probably took, say, Jonathan Taylor or Christian McCaffrey in the first. Like if your first running back off the board was James Conner in the fourth and I'm probably I'm, you know, as much as we love James Conner. Like, I mean, that makes me want to have four backs <laughs> a little bit more. And again, every draft will fall slightly different. So, you know, you'll, you can, you can, you can use this and it can still be pliable based on the way a draft is going, but general rule of thumb, but I don't know what your thoughts are, Ian, like just looking at, you know, the way these drafts are falling out. If you had any thoughts, you know, and kind of, Hey, I'd probably like to have this many of this kind of position by this point of draft. As always, it's going to depend a little bit on those players, as you pointed out. So if we do go a superhero approach and we take running backs in you know, rounds one and three or something like that, then I think we probably are good with only having three running backs by the end of round 10. And honestly, like the one mistake I think we've seen a little bit in best ball, the stream we've done, I've been doing some with uh, John Daigle and Hayden Winks on Thursday is some people, they just 
take like six or seven running backs sometimes, even after taking some studs early rounds. So this is another kind of thought with the overall roster construction, where if you have four guys at, by the end of round 10, and that includes, you know, two early, even three of these later guys, potentially, I don't know that you need to take more than one more back the rest of the way, man. Like, okay, if you want to take some extra shots on the James Cook rookie types that are just going to be depressed, you know, you're getting awesome value uh, pre-draft. That's one thing. But I do think generally, man, throughout the entire draft particularly if we are loading up fairly heavily early on man i don't know that you need more than five maybe at the most six running backs period yeah i think if you take you know two backs by like round five and then you add another two before round 10 like you should just honestly like you i might done. grab I, I i might grab one more and i would have five and be done if but I, i've also i've value, also built big time value that later that's fun yeah. And the thing with best ball, you have to remember, especially if you're going to play in some of these really big tournaments where, you know, you're trying to win these big prizes. It's also just embracing the fact that you can have two running backs get hurt and that team's just gone. It's wiped out. And that's OK. Like, last, you, yeah, because you're building a hopefully you're building a portfolio, right, of best ball teams, whether that, you know, and you want to budget and be responsible with it. But whether that's five or whether that's 100, like that's kind of what you're thinking through. It's OK to have some different types of constructions. Uh, I actually prefer that. I like to zoom out and be like, oh, wow, okay, I've, I've got this group of teams that I've really only got four or five backs on. And I got another group of teams, you know, where I waited a little bit longer. So maybe I have six, you know, and, and so on. Like, it just depends. Like, because um, every year, like, what's going to happen is, you know, some of those roster constructions are going to look better than others. Like, you know, I, I like looking back at a two to three year sample, but we don't have that necessarily for underdog. Um, so you want to talk some receivers, Ian? Yeah, otherwise I'm going to continue having more bad memories about my Raheem Mostert exposure. <laughs> let's, let's talk some pass catchers. No more flashbacks. Yeah. Oh. All right. So receivers um, again, and honestly, the receivers are the spot Ian, where like, if you're sitting there and you haven't taken your quarterback, you haven't taken your tight end and you're going to be staring like some players that are really hard to not take. Because I think this is really where there's there's some huge potential upside or value. Not all these guys are going to work, but some of these players that are going in this range, they're going to perform like fourth or fifth round picks, um, you know, from a standpoint of fantasy draft capital. So rounds eight through nine, you got the rookies, Garrett Wilson, Drake London, Traylon Burks. I'm going to come to the other rookies in a minute. I did this based on where they're going. So don't think of this just as, oh, this is Dwayne's rank. I have my ranks posted. You can go see those. But these are the ones going between round eight and nine. So you got Garrett Wilson, Drake London, Traylon Burks. They're all probably going to be first round picks. Some rumors of Burks slipping out of the first, but you and I talked about this last week. Man, if if any of these guys slide to the end of the first round, like they could immediately become, yeah. dude, they could shoot into the fourth round of fantasy drafts. Why? Because there are two teams sitting down there that have four picks at the end of the first round in the NFL draft. Those two teams are the Green Bay Packers and the Kansas City Chiefs. So they could be looking at someone like a Jahan Dotson today and they think that's who they're getting. And all of a sudden freaking Traylon Burks falls in their lap. And you, what do you think? Where's Traylon Burks going to go, Ian, if he gets drafted by the freaking Packers or the Chiefs? How far up is he moving in ADP? That's that's the thing, man, because I hear some of these particular dynasty like diehard folks like just talking about how landing stuck, like fade landing spot and just chase the talent. And. I'm okay with building your ranks before the landing spots and adjusting accordingly, but Burks could, you could argue for 2022 redraft at least, man. Yeah, he'd be the overall wide receiver one for these rookies if he goes to one of these. Any spots. one of these guys, really. If any one of these guys yeah. lands with those teams. And, and, I, and, and Dynasty, I kind of set aside. Like, there are components of Dynasty we want to use to think about that help us with best ball. They help us with redraft because we should be thinking about youth and upside and all these things. But really what is upside at the end of the day, upside is, did you get to draft a player later in a draft that basically outperformed their ADP? That's what upside is. Upside doesn't have to be young. Doesn't have to be old. Doesn't all it needs to be is a commodity that drastically outperformed what you spent on it. That's what upside is. And so in this case, yes, we're talking about young players, but for redraft, it's a little bit different than just dynasty. I agree. Like, just take the prospect you love the most based on the draft capital, all the other things you did. You know, we love you, dynasty Twitter. Like, go go do that. <laughs> well, in, every, a redraft, in a redraft this year, like, Traylon Burke, like, any one of these guys is going to shoot to the top. And, and I guess the other thing I would say is these guys are all graded so closely pretty much across the industry. 
I would give a tiebreaker to the one that has the best quarterback, one of the best three quarterbacks in the NFL. Yeah, I mean, I always hear they're like, oh, you know, we all took Clyde Edwards Lair over Jonathan Taylor. Like, yeah, that was bad if you happen Whoops. to do that. But <laughs> it's not like that. That's, you know, the only instance we've ever had of like a landing spot, like going south or not being good. I mean, look at Amon Ross St. Brown last year, man. Do you think he's doing that in a crowded offense? Probably not. Now, I'm not hitting on a Monra. We've talked about how good he was and everything, but that was a pretty big tell for him to be in an offense that wide open. I know we're talking a little bit more about the quarterbacks of him, but this is an even better situation than that because this, we have that same sort of wide open offense available with obviously more elite quarterback play than whatever Jared Goff was going to be offering us. So Garrett Wilson, Drake London, Traylon Burks, I agree. If any of them go to the Packers, Chiefs, I mean, hell, we can even throw a Lave. Um, Alave in there, and uh, oh my gosh, who's the other yeah, guy? yeah, Alave's in there for the round 10 guys. Uh, because Pickens, even if he decides to slide up, yep. And so, there will be guys that will join this group, right? And some of these could fall down a little bit, but but the bottom line is, man, it's gonna it's just rich in this area. Um, so the other thing that I've noticed, and we don't have to go super deep into this, but just you know, doing some drafts, looking at ADP a lot. Man, there's a lot of receivers in that middle, those middle rounds that like just they're not just screaming, pick me. Like it's kind of a flat spot. And there's a lot of guys that I feel the same about. So it's like I don't mind waiting a little bit on even if I want to get risky and take my wide receiver three and four in this spot. Now, what I would rather do, you know, is already have three receivers and take my wide receiver four and wide receiver five between round seven and 10. But again, that depends. What did you do with quarterback? What did, and we'll walk through some scenarios here for everybody here in just a second. But yeah, so in, in round eight, the next thing you get in is you've got our, our year two guys and year three guys that are still, you know, potentially ascending players. Kadarius Tony, um, you know, flashed really big. He only had 201 routes last year, but on those routes, like his yards per route run, all those things were elite. Brandon Ayuk, obviously we know took a step backwards last year, but you can get him in the ninth round right now. We know the talent is there. It's a crowded offense that wants to run the ball. We don't know what's going to happen with the quarterback. A lot of questions, but still in round nine, talent is enough to be buying in for Brandon Ayuk. And I hear folks are like, no, no, I'm just never doing that. Look, remember, the guys that have talent and they also have opportunity and the quality of their opportunity is, is great. Guess what? They went in the first three rounds. They're gone. That's why they go in the first three rounds. So don't sit here and bitch about, oh, well, this player doesn't have a great situation. He's just talented. Right. So at this point in the draft, you're looking for either players that have opportunity or players that have talent. And I like to lean to the talent in these later rounds just because there's so much that's unpredictable about a season. And, you know, what's going to happen with with injuries and all sorts of stuff that can can go on uh, real quick. Round 10, the Af the aforementioned, the one and only the great Rondell Moore <laughs> going around 10. You'll notice in my scenarios down at the bottom, like Rondell 10 is like on ha over half of them in round 10. Uh, Rashad Bateman. Chase Claypool. So these are all your year two, year three guys that have breakout potential. Um, Claypool, yeah, we, we got a narrative going on too. Deontay Johnson is not going to a uh, offseason workouts with Trubisky. Oh, I'm not, and he's a, I'm not so he's a, sure Claypool is, but Deontay isn't. <laughs> no, and I will tell you, like Deontay Johnson, when you watch his game, it is a timing based game. Like he's he he sets his game up to create. We're going to talk about separation in a minute. Deontay Johnson is a great route runner. He wins gaining separation and then getting, you know, going after yards after the catch. Um, so he needs he needs to have that. And also Mitchell Trubisky is not necessarily – hasn't shown to be like really the best timing quarterback so far. So that is pretty interesting. And I know you've already talked about, you know, I think you're the first person I've heard on record that, wow, Claypool could really end up being, you know, the better fit. And who knows? Like we still like Deontay more, but it's in the range of outcomes. And it's obviously it's, – it's representing their ADP. Chase Claypool, well, you get in round 10. Deontay, you got to take in round four. I mean, there's a big difference. You brought this up uh, maybe like five minutes ago about kind of that middle range of wide receivers. I see the allure a little bit of waiting just because once you kind of get past the top, 25 26 receivers like i'm not seeing that huge of a gap between kind of the upper tier the wide receiver three range all the way to like kind of the lower tier wide receiver four man like i think from like wide receiver 26 to wide receiver 48 we're not talking like that there will be different tiers of the guys but you have your Kadarius tonys your batemans your rondales going 10 12 spots after guys like you know your tyler lockett's Devonte smith michael gallops yeah i'm taking those latter guys before them i think they deserve to be ranked higher but i don't think the difference man is necessarily like worthy of these massive round uh, differences we can take advantage well, of. And, and what it does honestly 
because of what's happening, Lamar Jackson and Kyler Murray are falling down draft boards right now. Yeah, buddy. Um, they're going in round five and round six. So what this does, if you if, if you feel really good about this group of receivers that we're talking about, um, you could easily go ahead and take Kyler Murray. On, honestly, every time Kyler Murray is available in the sixth round to me this season, I'm just going to take him. Like, yeah. you know, I, I want exposure. I want exposure to a player that could throw for 5,000 yards and rush for 1,000. Am I saying he's going to get to those two things? No, I'm not. But – Give me the list of players that have that have that could do that. It's not Dude, very long. And all of his weapons are going cheaper now. Hopkins is sliding big time. Rondale the Moore, we talked about that. Zach Ertz, we talked about him. I do think they'll probably add a receiver at some point. If they don't, man, I've heard of worse last round picks than Antoine Wesley. Even he's someone that's uh, bit, you know a lot of people not at offense. Cliff Kingsbury, most notably, are obviously a fan of. Yeah, because the other thing you can do here is think of trade-offs. I know we kind of already talked about the tight end, but I could take Dalton Schultz in the fifth round, or I could take Lamar Jackson. Lamar okay. Jackson has the chance to be the QB1. Dalton Schultz is not going to be the tight end one. He's a nice player. He's going to get targets, but he's not a superstar, folks. Like, he's just not. So I'd rather go ahead and take Lamar Jackson, then turn around, and guess what? If Gronk plays, I'm going to – I might grade him ahead of Dalton Schultz anyway. Like that's just, you know, so it's like I can get Lamar Jackson. I can come back and get Gronk. I could come back and get Al Albert Okwabunum. I could get Zach Ertz. I, honestly, I feel the same about Gronk and Ertz as far as their floor as I do Dalton Schultz. Yep. I mean, so, the, all so, three of them are potential number two to number three pass game options with a damn good quarterback under center at the end of the day. And if I do it with Ertz and I took Murray – I could have an Ertz and Rondell Moore stack with Murray. Like, so I, I just, oh man, I'm, I'm really feeling. And, and if you if you take Lamar Jackson, uh, Marquise Brown's going around seven. I mean, you can get Hollywood and Rashad Bateman's going around 10. Devin Dillon so, is probably not even being drafted. <laughs> <laughs> and probably shouldn't be. <laughs> probably shouldn't be, to be fair, but. I love you, Ian. Uh, <laughs> so finish out round 10 on the receivers real quick. Tyler Boyd uh, and Chris Alave. So Alave, you know, he'll, he, Alave could easily land with Kansas City or Green Bay, and he could move up from here. But again, these are just the guys sitting that range. They are the type of profiles that we're looking for. So, man, you can just see, like, we've kind of hit it all. It is super rich. You can get your QB one. You can get your tight end one. You can get your upside receivers. You can get your RB2, threes, and fours. They are all here to be had. But the main point being, be thinking ahead as you're drafting. Don't get yourself into a situation where you start off with this monster draft and then you just turn around and completely like just shoot yourself in the foot. You let you let the Girl Scout come up to the book, come up to the door. You know, you don't even get to order the cookies you want. You may like Thin Mints. You, you may like the peanut butter. But you know what? Guess what? You don't you don't get to just, you know, sit there and choose which one you want and then totally avoid, you know, addressing what you need. Right. So just make sure that you think through that um, as, you're, right, as, you're, as you're drafting. I'm happy you included a uh, board in there. Someone that I consider a miss last year, just because I thought it was going to be a more even target distribution between him, Higgins and Chase, obviously Higgins and Chase kind of rose to the front of the pack. But the main argument for Boyd and something we bring up a lot was the fact that he was being priced last year, like as a very low end wide receiver three, more often than not a wide receiver four. And the conversation was, Hey, let's take him. I think his best case scenario is far higher. He, he was a legit wide receiver one with Joe Burrow under center in 2020. And the idea was that his floor can't be that low. What happened last year overall, wide receiver 31, wide receiver 38 on a per game basis. You didn't lose your fantasy championship from drafting Tyler Boyd, you know, in these later middle rounds. And I think that's another point to look at in 2022, because again, Dwayne, at this point in the draft, like Boyd's not going to be our wide receiver one. He's probably going to be our wide receiver five. You could do a lot worse in round I two. love it, man. I love it. Uh, especially in best ball, he can still give you the spike weeks where he catches the touchdowns. Yep. Um, we know he's probably third in the pecking order, but guess what? We have injuries. If either T. Higgins or Jamar Chase goes down, Tyler Boyd is now the second option in one of the better passing games. And so, yeah, I, I think Tyler Boyd, like, it's kind of crazy to me like how far he's falling. He and Alave, they're going actually in the 11th round. So, um, yeah, Boyd's a little bit – and, again, this is talking about what does upside mean. It means you could drastically outperform ADP. You, you could be old. You could be young. You know, it doesn't really matter. We tend to think of it as being younger players. There is a certain profile we're typically looking for, but all of a sudden you look up and there's Tyler Boyd sitting there and he doesn't fit the profile you think of with Rondell Moore – but he shouldn't be going in that range. He's a value in that range because of all the different things that could happen. The other thing that could happen, Ian, is, you know, 
Zach Taylor could just pull his head out of his ass and say, well, you know what? We're just going to, we're going to be like Buffalo and we're going to throw the ball 70% of the time. Like that could happen. Like they've got an offense that's good enough to do it. They've upgraded their offensive line so they can now protect Burrow. Like you can't, you can't sit there and act like that isn't in the range of outcomes. If you're doing that and you're blocking that out, like, man, you got to start zooming out more with the way you think about fantasy football. It's a lot bigger. We, I know we spend a lot of time talking about players and the data and we love that aspect. But you got to zoom out and you got to think bigger picture than just, you know, do I like this player? If, you, if that's the only way that you're going to draft, and yeah, that makes things fun, but you can't let it be the only thing. We're trying to help you win. And Boyd is a hit- wide receiver. Boyd's yeah, a wide receiver three, but he is his offense is number three pass game option. I mean, there are a lot of wide receiver twos that are also the number that they're also number three pass game option in their offense. So the fact the Bengals don't use Mixon heavily as a receiver, P. Ryan and Evans aren't going to be like 80 target guys. I highly doubt that Hayden Hurst is going to be more involved in the offense than CJ Uzoma was. With that in mind, you know, just keep Boyd wide receiver three, but remember that pecking order I think is more important than actually where you are on the depth chart. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so to kind of wrap it, just here, and there are more takeaways than this, but like this is just kind of to get everybody's like brain around like what we've been talking, you know, about. So one, if we don't take a quarterback by round six, you need to reserve a pick between round seven and ten. <laughs> you need to know that you're going to use one of those picks. Now, again, if quarterbacks are all falling down the board, say Josh Allen was the first quarterback to go off in your draft and he made it to the middle of the fourth and normally he's a third. A lot of times there's a cascading effect when that happens. Then all of a sudden you see Lamar Jackson go at the end of the fifth. Kyler Murray goes at the end of the sixth. Everything's getting pushed down a little bit. So adjust. You can kind of adjust. You can say normally I'd say round seven to ten, but for this draft between round eight and 11, I know that I at least want to get my QB one, especially in best ball. Next, if we don't take a tight end by round six, we need to reserve a selection for round eight. I think the strategy I'm really leaning into on tight end is if I don't take one of the top ones in, Earlier, I was kind of thinking, oh, I'm going to take one of these guys in the middle. I don't think I'm going to. Because I think, honestly, the, the guys we have listed here with Gronk and with Ertz and Albert O, I think they're just as good as the ones that are going in the middle, like Schultz and Hawkinson and all those guys. I like Especially those guys. Ertz and Gronk, man. We've seen them have these roles yeah. and do it out of Albert O's more of a bet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's an upside bet. But I agree. Gronk and Ertz, we know what they can do. Um, next thing, you know, if you want to take, if you wait until RB2 to start it in round seven through 10, just remember you're probably, you need to take multiple swings. Um, you know, look, I'm not saying it couldn't work and you couldn't do it some other way and get lucky and hit on some other stuff later in the draft. But I mean, you don't really want to come away with AJ Dillon as your RB2 and then just let your foot off and go back and hammer three more receivers. And now all of a sudden you have eight receivers on your roster, uh, you know, by round 11. I think you got to be careful i i prefer drafting the receivers um but at the same time like there is a limit so if you wait for your rb2 like i think you at least need to take two guys in that round seven to ten if you've already got your rb2 well then fine you may just grab one guy in that range you know i think you grab one more but you don't have to necessarily draft draft two or three in fact if you've already got two and you get to round seven i would say you're probably only taking one of those backs and again depending on the way your 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 board is falling you know all of a sudden you find a great value on a player yeah you're going to take it Um, But that's the beauty of this also is like when those values fall in your lap, you know, by creating this flexibility early and knowing what you need to do, you're you're already thinking multiple steps ahead. And then you should also know, okay, great. If I do take this value here, what does that mean I have to do in round 11 and round 12, those sort of things. Um, And if you want access to the year two and year three upside wide receivers, like you're going to, you're going to need to do it by round 10. Um, And I think, you know, once you get past those, there are going to be other players that we'll talk about later. But I think this is the real sweet spot. And again, round 11 did have Tannehill in there from a quarterback's perspective. Uh, You got uh, Chris Olave falling out in round 11, Tyler Boyd around 10, sometimes round 11. So you can still include those guys. They fit in that same mold. Don't be afraid to go ahead and take them um, in round 10. And so I did do a few different um, draft scenarios, Ian, just to kind of help people. So like if you're picking from an early position in the draft, let's say you have access to a Jonathan Taylor, Christian McCaffrey, Austin Eckler, you know, you pick the one that you want to take. Like I just kind of put some examples of how this would then play out. So you'll see like in my first example, I take my RB, I'll go ahead and take an RB2 in round five, like we did the other day, Ian, with Travis Etienne. Um, but what that means is once, and I actually, in this, that first one, I went ahead and took Kenneth Walker in round six. And what that meant though, so this draft, I started Jonathan Taylor, I came back AJ Brown, T Higgins, Terry McLaurin. And these aren't just stretch scenarios. Like these are the players going in this range. Yeah. And, and if so, if you wanted to say, oh man, I can't get AJ Brown there. Well, CD Lamb, someone like that, 
Mm -hmm. would have been there. So you can substitute the other name, um, but then come back and take ETN and Walker and notice I'm done with backs, but I, what have I not drafted yet? A quarterback. So round seven, Tom Brady, what do I do? Come back in round eight. I don't have a tight end yet. I stack Gronk with Brady, come back in round nine. And guess what? I go back at the receivers again, with Traylon Burks, Chris Olave. So now my receivers are AJ Brown, T Higgins, Terry McLaurin, Traylon Burks, Chris Olave, uh, running backs are Jonathan Taylor, Travis Etienne, Kenneth Walker, quarterback Tom Brady, tight end Rob Gronkowski. Like, man, I would love that start. Like, I would, I would feel work. freaking great. So I won't read all these to you guys. You can go check the article out. It's not behind a paywall right now, but I did some other options where you squeeze in a quarterback. I did an example where you take uh, Lamar Jackson in round five. And then what does that mean you got to do? Well, I ended up in that draft taking A.J. Dillon as my RB2 in round seven, and I came back with Chase Edmonds as my RB3 in round nine. And so it's just, it helps you start thinking there, okay, if I do this, if this value falls to me, what does this mean later? Um, middle draft position. Of course, I started everyone with Justin Jefferson. And the- got to, got to. <laughs> yeah. Like I, and I did it on purpose because I just want people to know, like, man, when you get to the end or the middle of the first round, like Justin Jefferson, like we want to, we want to diversify and do these things, but man, I'm like so excited about him this year. But again, I just did some different scenarios. The first one, I just started with three receivers. Justin Jefferson, C.D. Lamb, Jalen Waddle came back then with our boy James Conner, RB1. Went ahead and hit him on Ross St. Brown in round five. Now I've got four receivers and one back. And guess what? I And look, this is how flexible this is. And then I came back and still I took a quarterback, Kyler Murray, in round six. Came back with A.J. Dillon. And I got Chase Edmonds in round nine. My tight end one's Albert O in this scenario. And I still got my wide receiver five, which I know Ian loves, is Rondell Moore. What do I have? I have Kyler Murray throwing passes to Rondell Moore. Oh, he could also throw a check down touchdown pass to James Conner. So now you got a nice stack going. you got a good lineup looking. You don't really have any like major weaknesses. Alberto does have to come through. But to me, like when I look at this, like I feel really good about my construction, you know, 10 rounds through. And we don't have to hit the late round ones, but it just gives you examples based on where you're drafting the type of rosters that you could build. If you want to take a quarterback early, you want to take a tight end early. What do those things do? Like, what are the dominoes that cascade and what should you be thinking about moving forward in the draft and knowing that you need to be saving some picks in those seven to 10 rounds for the spots that you basically didn't, that you didn't address early. And again, the main note is like the beauty of it is you can do anything like you really can. Like everything is there in round seven through 10. There's not a lot of years where it's been this way. Ian. A lot of years it's like, I know I can get my quarterback there and I know I can get my receiver. And I mean, I feel the running backs are the new part that's getting added in here. Like last year, Chase Edmonds was basically in the same scenario he's in now. And he was a fifth round pick. Kareem Hunt last year was a fifth, sixth round pick. You can get him in round eight. A.J. Dillon going a little higher than last year. Um, so but it's, it's some of these backs that are floating down used to. Really, I would always feel good about the receivers. Not always, but typically receivers and quarterbacks, I would feel pretty good about. But this year, tight ends and running and running backs are also there. That's what I was going to say. So, like, you have given every all of our lovely listeners and readers the chance to, you know, make up their own mind because you can literally do everything that you want to do here and wait on whatever position. With that said, Dwayne, it seems like to me, looking at how some of these have played out, having uh, having had our conversations over the past few months and even years at this point, I'm more comfortable waiting at tight end, I think, this year. Like, early on, that's a strategy I would prefer to do because being able to get a Gronk or Albert O in round eight or nine, I mean, hell, we can then go ahead and take someone like Irv Smith a couple rounds later if we're not feeling all that thrilled about Albert O. But I want more chances at these wide receivers early rounds in getting someone like a Lamar Jackson or a Kyler Murray. Like, come on, Lamar versus Dalton Schultz. I... That should not be a conversation, but it's going to be if people aren't, you know, as tuned in this roster construction as they should be. So out of these scenarios, you're a great cool. I agree. Yeah. I think um, I want my access to Kittle and Waller. I'm definitely going to build some Kittle and Waller teams Mm -hmm. and and you can do it. Um, But I don't think I'm really going to touch hardly at all. Those tight ends that are going in in a tight end premium format that are going between like rounds four and eight. I don't think I'm going to, or sorry, rounds four and six. I don't think I'm going to have them because, and what you just mentioned, um, the receivers, to me, the, the receivers, the, the drop off is bigger this year from the top. And, and the other part, I, we'll, we'll refine these as we go. But, man, I don't have a ton of conviction around a lot of those middle round receivers. There's certain ones that we like, like we like Amon Ross St. Brown. We like Michael Pittman. But then as you start getting past those guys, I feel like there's a really big group that I'm like, man, just give me Kyler Murray. <laughs> like, just, you know, um, and so 
knowing what you can still do at the receiver later. Yeah, I, I agree. I'm, I'm definitely going to be going with the later tight ends quite a bit. And arguably multiple running backs in the first six rounds. I think that makes sense too. I'm not saying you need to go three or four or anything like that. We're not getting robust in here, but I do think. And I, yeah, and I didn't too. do that on any, any of these, but man, like I would not mind. I may have done it on one. No, I didn't. But like, so. If, getting if like you four running backs the, in the first six rounds. I would be curious how that would end up looking. I think three is probably be more like my range, but. Yeah. But even even if like, like thinking and none of these examples where I did where I took Jonathan Taylor, did I come back and take a James Conner in round four? I would love to do that. <laughs> Give me James Conner, uh, you know, as my RB two and then Travis Etienne as my upside RB three. And then Hollywood instead ACL. of Walker. Exactly. So I think there's a lot of options to do that as well. And maybe that's maybe that's something we'll we can think through as we do some of these drafts that we have coming up. Like ultimately what we want to do is like actually like execute on some of these things we're talking about and let people see it, you know, play out in a draft. Again, that lovely article from Mr. McFarland, fantasy football strategy, reverse engineering and adaptable winning 2022 draft plan. Look forward to continuing to update that as the ADP gets better and better throughout the off season. Before we keep on going, I just want to give a shout out and let you all know that right now you can get 50% off a PFF elite annual subscription. If you use code draft 50, 365 days of elite. You can get all of our locked article content, the PFS NFL draft guide, completely unlocked mock draft simulator, data and grades, all that, and so much more. The fantasy football rankings. Look, if you know you are going to sign up for PFF ahead of next fantasy season because you would like to quadruple 10 times, 100 times your money, whatever the hell your goal is, go sign up now. Draft 50 gets you 50% off. That's going to be as good, if not better, of any promo code we're going to give out throughout this entire season up until fantasy week one. So truly, people, Draft 50 gets you 50% off a of PFF Elite annual subscription. Also, PFF is launching Hutch, a four-part podcast series with number one overall NFL draft prospect, Aiden Hutchinson, on April 13th. Yes, Aiden did rip my heart out the Saturday after no, uh, Saturday after Thanksgiving when he took it to the Ohio, entire Ohio State offense. Not illegal to chip defensive ends, guys. I don't know. Throw a couple screens out to all of your first-round wide receivers. Why are we trying to block Aiden Hutchinson one-on-one -on -one in the snow all freaking game? We have the better athletes on the outside, Dwayne. What are we doing? Damn it. Oh, I hate you, Aiden Hutchinson, but you're also really good at football, and I appreciate what you're doing with PFF. Austin Gale, let up Hutch. It's, it's going to be really cool, guys. Jim Harbaugh uh, is going to be interviewed. Current and former Michigan football players, key members of Aiden's family, media members, and draft analysts. Even if you're like me and you don't like Aiden Hutchinson because you're a bitter, shallow Ohio State lifer, you should still respect that this dude is likely going to be a number one overall pick and having this sort of, you know, just depth and ability to see behind the scenes of what he's going through. Uh, truly an opportunity that we don't get all that often. So, you know, putting my scarlet and gray aside, I can still say that I'm excited to see what Hutch is going to be like. So remember that four part podcast series comes out on April 13th which is a lovely Wednesday and a great day to be great. Also want to point out the only true guaranteed quality pickup this season is Manscaped, the leaders in below the waist grooming with Manscaped Performance Package 4.0. Your skill position will be sleek and smooth enough for a sub 4340. Support us and head to manscaped.com and use the exclusive code PFF at checkout for 20% off and free shipping. Again, that's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com and use code PFF. Turn your Mr. Irrelevant to a first round pick with Manscaped. All right, Dwayne, how the separation stuff start this weekend? You know, I I like to kind of wind down a little bit Saturday and Sunday. You know, I'm not necessarily – this Sunday, actually, I was, like, writing about the USFL till 1 a.m., so a little bit more of a – I was just going to say, you were – I knew you were grinding this weekend. I, I, I was grinding <laughs> this weekend, but generally I'm not necessarily uh, waking up writing. We don't usually podcast on the weekends, but, you know, I still like to scroll Twitter, and, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know how the Twitter algorithm works. My God, all we want is a chronological list of the people we follow. <laughs> Figure it out, Twitter. I know you can – can use tweet deck for that but either way maybe because i always interact with Dwayne on twitter or this or that i just see you Dwayne, talking to ray g scott barrett one industry person after another about separation and contested catches and some of the maybe fallacies we have around these metrics all great information i'm not sure uh what exactly started all this uh you want to let the folks know why we were so passionate and you in particular about separation and contested catches um in the middle of freaking april yeah, well, I thought Ray, uh, Ray G did a nice job. Like he actually posted, um, you know, a video 
of uh, freshman wide receiver Evan Stewart um, from uh, Texas A&M. And it was just talking about the throw being behind and it created a contested catch situation. But the receiver had already gained separation over the top of the corner. And so, you know, there's a lot of hate around separation metrics. And so I've spent a lot of time, you know, this offseason working with our PFF data team, understanding how do we chart all these plays? What are the definitions for all these things? And so I just kind of jumped in. You know, and because right, you know, Ray specifically quoted, you know, great example of excellence, uh, route phase separation turned in, into contested catch, into contested catch. Should we be knocking a wide receiver for this? And he said, context always matters. Yeah, you know what, Ray G? I know context matters, <laughs> man. Um, and so I'm probably going to jump on a pod with, with Ray next week. So uh, we just kind of went back and forth and we were talking through it. Scott Barrett, you know, he had a separate thread going on contested catch stuff. But I agree with, with Ray G and the way that PFF charts this stuff actually – agrees with it as well. So for example, if you've got a player that's already created that separation has gotten open, there's two different, the way we grade these things is, is you've already gotten credit for being open, right? And we, and we grade every route, whether or not, you know, the player is targeted or not. Now we're not doing that for college right now, but we are doing it for NFL, but the same principles apply, right? And when I saw this video, you know, I just kind of jumped in and I 100% I agree. And so what we're trying to do and the way that we look at it is that would not go against the receiver. The receiver already got open. Now the contested catch, you know, we would look at like, was the player able to execute? Yes. The quarterback underthrew the ball. Were they able to make the catch? Because it is a tool in the tool bag. Again. And so yeah. I, the thing I would like to say, I know you got a chart up here. We'll talk about in just a second that looks at contested catches. Scott Barrett actually had a great thread going on with the contested catches over on Twitter. You guys can go check that out from Scott. Um, but the big thing for me is like, look, some because separation, the other thing you people are just like, oh, just get rid of these metrics. And I disagree with that. The key is, though, you have to do it on routes. You cannot do it just on targets. If you're just doing it on targets, you're creating you can. There's a lot of noise involved. One, like you got the quarterback, you know, accuracy. You got the timing of the throw. You know, a receiver can be open and the quarterback gets to him late in a read. There's a lot of different things. That can go on that can go on so one of the really cool things about what the pff team is doing this charting all this is they're really looking at it you know is the receiver getting open in the timing of the route because if you guys know like how it works you know the quarters the quarterback you know is getting the snap you know if he's under center he's doing his drop back it's a five it's a seven step drop but there's milestones that every one of these receivers is trying to get to at different points you know in the play because there's different route combinations designed to set each other up give the quarterback the read through the progression but basically what we're trying to look at is say the receiver's running a five yard hitch in underneath it's uh say it's third and five man coverage they're not just giving the player you know it's not third and 12 and they're just right. saying we don't need to cover a two yard hitch like that doesn't count as being open you don't get you don't get credit for being, you know, for creating separation on a two yard hitch when a guy's playing 10 yards off on third and 12, that doesn't count. But so that no grades given for that, but let's say the same situation, it's third and five, it's man coverage, defense is blitzing, whatever. But we know that that defender is truly trying to take away anything underneath because they can't let them get five yards to get a first down. But let's say that receiver could get completely open, but the quarterback doesn't throw it to him. So if the, if the receiver is getting open, coming out of his break off of the hitch, then that counts as the receiver did their job. The quarterback didn't end up going there with the read. And if the receiver's targeted, you know, we're really grading it, you know, the same way. So that's what I like about where we're trying to go and what we're trying to do as a company. Just last year, did we really start charting uh, and grading this stuff for all routes? And so the team is also honestly like they're still working through all that. But we've got like I've got to read like all the process, the way we do all these things. But at the end of the day, the way I look at it is the other thing is you don't want to just discount a player, you know, for contested catches. One, because of the reason that Ray highlighted on Twitter. But I think number two is players win different ways, Ian. You know, if, if we just wanted to take away and say, well, a, a player can't be good if they don't separate all the time. Like, well, what will we do with Brandon Marshall? Brandon Marshall doesn't <laughs> need to take. separate. Yeah. Brandon Marshall does not need to separate as much as, uh, you know, Brandon Cooks or as some of these other guys. Why? Because, well, he's a beast and like he. He's he's open when he's not open, and so he he's got to have the right kind of quarterback to trust him. But I think we just need to get into more of a, I think this is this is me. This is kind of getting on my soapbox. Like different players win different ways. What I would ultimately love to have Ian is a player that can separate, but also a player that can win when the balls are contested. And I think because that's the point a lot of people 
are missing. They're two separate skills. Contested catches are measuring something different than per route separation. The original point you brought up at Ray G. Receiver gets wide open off the line of scrimmage. That's a win for separation. You can't penalize him for separation just because the ball is underthrown and it now became a contested catch situation later in the route. So two main takeaways from everything you've just said, Dwayne, for me are separation and contested catches. Two different things that should be separated accordingly, man, because yeah, you should Hopefully we get someone that can separate. And then when the quarterback makes a bad throw, they can also go back and make that contested catch. So realizing that those are separate and then also using per route data instead of per target data, whenever available NFL games, we now have 17 per season. Look at every other sport. This is still such a small sample size. We have 11 guys on both fields. We're ramming each other. We're wearing pads, hitting helmet. It is such a freaking random game compared to everything else going on in the world of sports. I mean, golfers are hitting a stationary ball. There's one person on the course, basketball, five on five. There's only a, you know, kind of certain amount of things that can even happen on a per play baseball. We have the largest sample sizes of them all. Why would we not use the largest sample size at hand, which is routes as opposed to targets. And, you know, it's just not one of those things where routes are giving us the opportunity to see what they're doing. Every single play with the separation, we're not just holding them to a selected kind of sample size that once again, can easily be thrown off the mark by a quarterback, either not being accurate or throwing the ball when he shouldn't be throwing the ball. So that's kind of, I think, uh, at its core, man, what PFF has always been trying to do. We're trying to look at players individually, see how they are doing without necessarily penalizing them because of their teammates. So separation yeah, and contested, think, and, two and separate even, things, and per route, not per target. Yeah, and even like, you know, I, that was a great summary. But like Thanks. even with separation, like, look, some players are really great at separating on hard breaks, you know, uh, dig routes, comeback routes, hitch routes, uh, even out routes, you know, anything 90, you know, 90 degrees or more. Um, and then they're not great at separating over the top though. You know, they, they can't gain separation on a go route. So, I mean, there's, there's varying degrees like Drake London's a great example. He's not the best at, at really separating on a go route. Like I didn't really see him stack anybody in single man coverage. And I watched every rep like this. It, we're fortunate because we have really cool tools in the back end mm -hmm. where we can go say, show me single man coverage, Drake London. And I can just watch them all over and over and over where other people are having to hunt and peck. through like <laughs> 5,000 videos on YouTube to try to, you know, piece all this stuff together. Um, but where is Drake London really good, man? You throw him a comeback route, you throw him a hitch route, you throw him, you know, a, a dig route, an out route. Like he creates good separation, you know, on all of those things. So is he going to be a five tool player? I know I kind of, you know, giving a little tease to what he may be doing later uh, this week. No, I would. Drake London is not a five tool player, but he's a three or four tool player who could still be really good. Right. So I think those are kind of the different nuances. Um, like Amari Cooper, we've talked about before, not great at contested catches, not great, you know, winning, you know, over the shoulder down the field, um, but great at separating underneath. You tell Amari to run a slant route, you tell Amari to run an out route, you tell him to run, you know, anything that has to do with setting up the defender and creating a hard break. Like he's elite at that. But maybe that's why Amari's never gotten to like a 30 percent target share is because the other half of the game just has never shown up. So I do think if you can find the prospects that have both or the potential to have both. Those are the ones, Ian, I think that can turn into target hots. De Devontae Adams is a great example. Devontae Adams might be the best route runner in all of football, but he can also win when it's tight coverage. He can also win when it's a contested catch. And so those are pretty rare. Like Stefan Diggs is one of the best route runners in the league, but he's not elite in the contested catch range. And it seems like we're, you know, if you do believe, which I don't know, we got, you know, smart industry minds like Matt Harmon, who's been doing great work with reception. Oh, reception dude, Matt's the best. Over the Matt's years, awesome. his first profile out on Drake London is basic. You know, he's not concerned about the separation, the route running ability. So it seems like for London, maybe the detractors are not only – perhaps misguided with pegging this against them in the first place, but perhaps I think they're holding this specific skill way more against them than any other negative with these other prospects, because doing the five tool kind of wide receiver research, Dwayne, I did it for last draft class as well. Kyle Pitts was the only wide receiver or tight end that checked every single box in the last class. You know, a lot of these wide receivers were under 200 pounds. So they just simply weren't big enough to qualify. It's looking that way this year. Like I, on my first glance, I did not see a single eligible wide receiver that is over the 50th percentile mark in height, weight, speed, 
hands, route running, and uh, playmaking. Now, I think that's actually a six-tool receiver. We can combine height and weight <laughs> and the size. How about that? And we'll get back down to our SEO-friendly uh, five-tool. But, yeah, so I get it. Drake London, you know, can not necessarily gonna confuse him with, you know, a Chris Alave in terms of smoothness in and out of his breaks. But, my God, if he's still pretty damn good at it and he does everything else at a high level, I think we can maybe look past that. So, you know, separation, maybe he is – maybe you deem he is only a five or six out of ten. But damn it, Dwayne, the guy does a lot of other good things at an awfully high level. Yeah, I mean, I think London, you know, like in a loaded class, you know, he would go later than where he's probably going to go this year. But again, that doesn't mean that that he can't be good, you know. And I I chose London because I know he's a guy that a lot of people think I'm just super down on. I'm just not as high as some other people on Drake London. I still have him at four. You know, I just don't have him in my top two like others. And for the folks that have him in the top two, I mean, I get it. I totally get it. Um, and for the folks looking at this on YouTube, because they're probably wondering, like, what the hell is the thing we're staring at? <laughs> staring at? So this is just an example. So what I did is I just broke down contested catches for the 2021 college season for most of the top prospects. And just to give folks an idea of on those contested catches, how often was it an accurate throw or within the frame of the receiver by the quarterback? Or was it an inaccurate pass that the receiver still caught? And so inaccurate would be, Hey, um, you know, it's high above the receiver. They had to turn back for it. It was still within their, their, it was still within their range to catch, but they had to definitely make an adjustment and do a good job to catch the ball. And so if you look like uh, some examples that pop out to me immediately, Jahan Dotson, um, 50%, you know, of his contested catches came because of the court, his quarterback was inaccurate. Like, so you got to be really careful with the contested catch thing because the thing, the underlying data points like this, Drake London, 10 of his, uh, targets out of 26 that were contested catches were due to uh, the USC quarterback. So 38%, uh, one of the higher ones, but like the hot, the highest ones, Justin Ross, 50%, Jahan Dotson, 50% were inaccurate. 46% of uh, Sky Moore's contested catches were due to inaccuracy by the quarterback. Uh, Traylon Burks, 44%, his quarterback was terrible. 44%, like watching that game film, I'm like, no wonder they line him up in the backfield. Like the, you know, the quarterback can't hardly throw downfield. Jamison Williams, even, even, you know, he only had nine on the season, but four of them were due to inaccurate throws from Bryce Young. So just to kind of give folks a flavor, I don't think, I think contested catches, you know, because we don't have all the data set yet, you know, for college um, on every route, it's like trying to piece together the story. And I think that's fine. I would just be, I would just warn against overweighting it too much. Let's face it, Dwayne, they look cool as shit. There's a reason why we call it mossing someone and we don't call it like <laughs> Wes welkering someone by getting free. You know, this is something to be said about uh, just jumping over someone and making that big catch. Uh, all, you know, style point jokes aside, I do, again, just think that realizing separation contested catches can and usually are two completely different things uh, can help us when uh, further evaluating these guys. So good stuff, Dwayne. I'm sure this won't be the uh, last time we talk about some separation contested catch goodness on this pod but i think that's enough here for april 12th let the people know what else you got on pff.com ahead of this week because wow you know the fantasy industry might be sleeping we never do yeah absolutely so um i will be updating my rookie running back and rookie wide receiver rankings the rookie running back ranks will come out tomorrow the wide receiver ranks will come out on Friday. So a few adjustments. I'll be adding in all of the pro day information, and then I'll also be adding in the updated expected draft capital. We had Grinding the Mocks put out a uh, a new list last week. So I think the last one I had in there was like from March 22nd. So it should be a pretty good update on that. So just taking the, the, the metrics that we know historically have mattered for these positions as far as predicting future success in the NFL for fantasy, taking their expected draft position, putting those things together and basically giving you my tears before the draft, which basically is getting everything ready. So once we have the draft, Ian, we can quickly come back in and then we're updating those sort of things to say, okay, we actually know where they landed. Now here is, you know, what the data says. Check all that out, pff.com. Dwayne on Twitter for more separation barking throughout all hours of the day at Dwayne McFarlane. Uh, Hey, again, you know, I'm not going to force, I'm not going to ram USFL down your guys' throat every single podcast, but truly, if you are interested, check out that 90 minutes I did with Cody Main on Monday. That'll get you, I think, about as well caught up on the league as you could hope for. And if you're more of a reading type, I do have an ultimate preview up on pff.com for free. I'll some other, you know, more NFL fantasy related stuff up there. Throughout the week going into next week though 
Dwayne, you might just be entering these USFL streets as well, utilizing, hence something, utilizing. Yes. Yeah, we could utilize there. something that something. you are going to enjoy. Oh, that you are interesting stuff there. There's your tease, Dwayne. So piss off about me not teasing. <laughs> For Dwayne, well, hey, at, least, at least you didn't threaten to break, to break my glasses today. So we're doing. Good. Yeah, we got the vibes high. I'm going to uh, Reds Guardians later this afternoon. Still got to catch myself and not uh, not call them the I words anymore. I guess so. Roll Tribe either way, and then hopefully my Cleveland Cavaliers take down the uh, Brooklyn Nets later. Not quite as confident in that, but we'll see, Dwayne. I don't really worry about these beta sports that much, but I do enjoy going to a baseball game, man. It's a good time if the weather is fine. Uh, you know, I, I feel like going to a baseball game, like the tickets and you know, kind of the prices there, they aren't breaking your back like some of these other events. Are you a are you a pro go to a baseball game guy? Oh yeah, yeah. So like baseball was actually like you know I used to that was my second favorite sport to football. Like as I got older, had kids, they had sports, you know, like I had to give something up. And so baseball is ultimately what went to the wayside just because it's like, you know, keeping up with it so much. But yeah, we still absolutely love to go to a game, have a hot dog, have a beer, have some peanuts, get shit all over the place. Ian. Yeah. Yeah. Love it. Baseball. I think man, football is always chill, man. love, but yeah, I used to pl love playing football and baseball almost equally. And then all these jackass kids had to start throwing curveballs and breaking shit. I just had no, I was well, playing. nowadays you have to start playing baseball at the age of three to be here. Yeah. <laughs> and you better be in the South where you can play year round. Otherwise uh, you are going to be in rough shape. So keep that in mind. I never had a jump shot either. So might as well just lose some brain cells and <laughs> ram my head into people. So, oh, well, worry about that later. Hopefully uh, Cleveland sports can stand up, do something good uh, for your boy today. For Dwayne, I'm Ian. Thanks so much for tuning in to PFF Fantasy Football Podcast. And until next time, take care, everybody.